Okay, well, good morning, good day. I don't know what time it is in your time zone, uh, given that we're not all in Vienna. I hope you like my reminder for those of you who've been to Vienna, to EGU. Uh, the backdrop hopefully will be familiar to you. It's the entrance to the, to the EGU venue. I hope you like that. Um, but uh, yeah, on behalf of myself and my fellow conveners, thanks very much for joining this EGU Union Symposium, Union Symposium 4, communicating a global climate crisis. If our house is on fire, why haven't we called the fire brigade? Um, I have had to make a very hasty rewrite of these opening words this morning because very sadly and in a stark illustration of the impacts of this current uh, global pandemic, one of our speakers, Simon Clark, has had to drop out um, because he is uh, having suspected coronavirus symptoms. Um, a huge disappointment um, because we were all very much looking forward to, to Simon's contribution. Um, most importantly, we wish him to get well very, very soon, but Simon has offered to create a, a YouTube video um, in place of his talk today, which we will try and share later on. Um, so yeah, get well soon, Simon. Looking forward very much to that to that video. Um, so what we do have over the next 100, meet, 100 minutes even um, is three really great speakers um, who will be examining science communication essentially through the lens of a climate emergency. Um, I kind of think what we're doing here is we're examining the challenge posed so effectively by a certain Swedish teenager. Uh, why does nobody listen to the scientists? Um, but specifically, if we know our actions are having an enormous impact on the planet, our home, and potentially threatening our own existence, is a lack of understanding actually the main issue? Do people properly understand what's going on and, and how our actions are impacting things? Um, I felt a little bit touchy about this after I wrote it last night, noting the, the events of this morning with Simon dropping out. But, but I think it's important to consider the contrast with coronavirus is very interesting. COVID-19 clearly presents an immediate and present danger to us all. And, and, and we canceled this conference as a result, and we're all aware of that risk, and we're all taking precautions. We don't want to die. We don't want our friends to die. So we're taking action. But the contrast with the climate emergency, well, you know, the weather outside is, is pretty nice today. It's very nice. We've just had the, the sunniest April on record. Um, and, and last year I heard that in Glasgow in Scotland, the weather will soon be a bit like Barcelona. And, you know, if you've ever been out in Glasgow on a, on a wet, cold night, you, you might think that's not such a bad thing. Um, but really, if our actions are putting our home at risk, it, it mustn't be due to ignorance, um, to a failure of communication and understanding. That's unacceptable. We mustn't be in a situation where people can say, I didn't know. So that's really our theme. Um, and, and here's a thought, perhaps a challenge. Are scientists really the right people to communicate science? Is it better that the science is made by the scientists, perhaps, uh, and then presented and shared by others? And I hope that's the theme we can explore in this session. Um, another theme that I hope we can touch on, or at least consider during this session, maybe in questions and discussions, science communications with our own, within our own community. Um, I think it's vitally important that scientists can communicate their messages, their research with the external community. But quite often, the messages fall flat within our own community. I, I have the biggest enthusiasm for EGU of anybody you'll find, but there are numerous sessions that I come out of thinking, what did I just learn? You know, I, I see something that's of relevance to me, but I don't quite get the takeaway. Uh, and I think that's something we all need to consider. We need to make our work, though there may be detail that's relevant to the specialists who are the same as you, um, everybody needs to understand what you were talking about and why. So I think we all need to address that one. Um, and just as an example, um, last year in, in a session on plastic pollution, Eric Van Sebeel talked of a giant whirling police speed gun in space. And, and he immediately was bumped to the top of my list of people I wanted to have lunch with. And in fact, we did later that week because I loved that way of describing the technology he was talking about to monitor ocean currents. It, it resonated for me, it made sense. It made me want to go talk to him. Um, so, okay, enough from me on, on, on the theme. Um, thanks to people. I'll start off by thanking my co-conveners um, for wonderful people who've helped to bring this session together. Uh, without them, it, it probably wouldn't have worked. So thanks very much. Um, and our wonderful speakers. Um, we are down to three from the original six that was planned, but we've got three great speakers. Uh, and we hope very much we'll be able to hear from the other three later on. Um, and I think finally on the thanks is to thank Chloe, who's sitting top left in my screen. You're probably not seeing her, but she's been, a, she, Chloe from EGU Policy is, is really, without her, this wouldn't be happening. Uh, and she keeps the show on the road whilst it's running. So, you know, I've got to say thanks to Chloe. She's been awesome. Um, a quick notice, um, today in the UK where I'm based and where a few of us are based, um, there is a two minute silence, which is scheduled for 
12 o'clock Central European time. Um, it, technically, it marks the end, 75 years since the end of war in Europe, of World War II. But what we're going to do in recognition of that is take a 30 second break in which people are invited just to consider losses, you know, whether it be through war, whether it be through the virus, whatever it be, just a pause to think uh, and just consider on, on, on losses and, and, and the value of life, I guess, and the value of, of, of looking after each other and the planet we live on. Um, finally, some practical advice. Um, please ask questions in the Q&A double bubble. Um, so throughout the week, apparently, there's been a quite a few people asking questions in the chat window. If you look on the bottom of your screen, you should see a sort of double speech bubble window called Q&A. That's where you ask questions. Um, the moderators of the session are going to pick up those questions and, and direct them to the speakers. The other thing to be aware of, you will only see your question in that window. So don't expect to see everyone else's question. You won't have the luxury of knowing if someone else has just asked the same question. You'll just see yours. Um, and the chat bubble is for just that, for chat. Um, you can direct that to everybody or I think just to the panel. Um, but I think that's probably enough from me. Um, so I'd like to hand you over to Professor Ian Stewart, who's going to introduce the speakers for us. Thanks very much, Ian. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, we got. I mean, the three speakers that we've got are all very different, so they're going to get you know a variety of different perspectives. And you know, we've got what looks like 461 participants out there, so there's a huge variety of perspectives out there in the audience that's listening. But our first speaker is is Leo Hickman. Leo is director and editor of Carbon Brief, which is a, a UK-based website that covers the latest developments in, in climate science, climate policy, energy policy. And before joining Climate Brief. Uh, Leo was the WWF UK's chief advisor on climate change. So, so Leo, uh, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thank you very much, Ian and Nick, and um, thank you so much for inviting me to to um, present um, this morning. It's wonderful to hear so many numbers are watching online. Um, yeah, so just before before I kick off and I share the screen with my presentation, yeah, just that. Yeah, that's my that's I'm coming from the perspective of of a journalist who's I guess been writing and talking and discussing and explaining kind of climate change and climate science and the kind of policy consequences and implications of climate um, change for probably oh, don't know probably almost 20 years now I was at the Guardian for 16 years from the sort of the mid to late 90s um, through to about 2013, which, as you will see in my presentation, spans quite an interesting period of, of both communicating climate change, but also the, the, sort of the swirling storm that has been raging around the business model and technological implications of journalism. So we've had the internet, social media, all those, and, the, and journalism itself um, being quite challenged in terms of you know how it pays for itself and that all has rippled and had impacts on how I and other journalists have tried to write about climate change over over that period of time so here goes I'm going to plunge in now and try and share a screen let's see if this works um, so hopefully everyone will see the first slide good I'm getting thumbs up okay um, <clears throat> So yeah, so, so so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just well, I've got about 15 minutes or so. I'm just going to um, probably split this slightly into two. So a bit of a walk through the timeline of of my time really of of covering climate change as a journalist, but also to reflect a bit on what I do now, which is a carbon brief, which is a very particular type of journalism, which I'll talk about in the second half. But I'll, I'll let's kick off and let's sort of go back in time a bit. Let's go back to 1990, which so sort of 30 years ago, um, and this broadly is the period of how how long journalists have really mainstream journalists and and the, the, the big sort of national and international publications have been covering climate change. I would argue there are there are good examples from the 80s and obviously before then of specific moments where journalists have, have written up a interesting paper or a landmark event, but. I think in terms of the sort of drumbeat, increasing drumbeat of coverage that have, has happened, that's really been from the sort of the early 1990s onwards. And it's, it's no accident, I don't think, that that is when the first IPCC report came out. So this, this is quite striking because this is, 
the time so this is the uk's kind of arguably that still to some extent establishment paper newspaper um um and on the very front page on may 26 1990 you have margaret thatcher opening the hadley center um the, the, the famous hadley center for climate change which i think is now in exeter but i think at that point was in near reading when it opened um and interestingly if you look at the if you look at the headline you've got thatcher set tough global warming target so this is an incident where journalists are covering not the science per se but the policy implications this is politicians reacting to the science and th this has been this is a crucial part of the dynamic of how journalists have and the reasons the moments when journalists choose to cover climate change is often led not so much by the science moments the, the ar the the sorry the ipcc reports are key landmark events every six or seven years but it's often the policy moments that are are the sweet spots for journalists um in addition to some of the big big kind of headline grabbing kind of science papers that come out it's not also an accident that the very same time just a month earlier this I, I a few years ago i went through the archives to try and find the first example of a of a national newspaper running an opinion piece by a climate skeptic so we already have in in 1990 um um an example a prominent example this is the daily mail this is a lead op-ed lead opinion piece um questioning and it, I, I have got time to go through it but if you if anyone wants to email me afterwards i can send them this article but it, it effectively sets out the playbook of how the climate skeptics have, have attempted to undermine the policy response to climate change by attacking the science and that today even is still quite a um a, a common tactic in the US, the, this same this same playbook, if you like, would, had been going for about two or three years earlier. There are good examples from about 1988 of the Wall Street Journal, for example, carrying very similar op-eds to this. Um, then we jump forward 20 years to 2009. Now, this is a really interesting front page because I don't think we will ever, hopefully, ever see a front page like this ever again. So this is the Daily Express, a kind of mid-market tabloid in the UK, um, running um, a headline, which is kind of striking in a way, to even think this would be running just even 10 years ago. 10 reasons why global warming is natural, no proof that human activity is to blame. Um, notice the date. So it's Tuesday, December the 15th, 2009, and probably some people will realize what the significance of that date is and why the, the Daily Express would choose that day to, to drop this front page. And that was just at the end of the Copenhagen summit, um, the, the UN climate summit, which um, is is famous for, quote, failing. Um, I think there's some interesting analysis to be done around in, in by historians to do whether the Copenhagen was an out and out failure or not but that it, it it's interesting that this is it's a reminder just 10 years ago or so of what the in particularly the UK or the Anglosphere um, media particularly the, the UK the Australian and the US media um, were pretty climate skeptic at that point um, um, if I keep going forward in time this is an example of I, don't, I wasn't working for the guardian at this point but it's not long after i was but this is quite a striking front page because <clears throat> so the date um valentine's day 2014 and it, it highlights how papers newspapers particularly in the media they follow extreme weather events that's another reason why um, journalists will turn to covering climate change and particularly putting it on the front page um, and actually, this is quite an unusual front page because effectively it's it's an opinion piece really by Nick Stern, the economist, um, right on the front page um, in this kind of language. Climate change is here now. It could lead to global conflict, yet the politicians squabble um, and the big picture of UK flooding. Um, then we jump forward a few more years, um, and I'm just doing this to quickly show you the progression, and then we jump to the sun. The, the, um, one of the UK's biggest selling newspapers still, you know, the key, one of the key tabloids. In the middle of the European heat wave and actually global heat wave, because at the time there were some fires in California, et cetera, et cetera, and Siberia and Greece and, and everywhere. 
And this, this front page is striking, not just visually, because it's using, you know, the, the I think that's an anomaly map, I can't, a temperature map. But what I can't quite show you here is it says at the very bottom, continued on page two, if you flick to page two, in paragraph three, it quotes climate scientists. Um, it doesn't quote climate skeptics, it doesn't quote a politician, it quotes climate scientists. And that's really unusual. And, it, and I think it shows progress to some extent that climate scientists would be the go-to people to quote in this story straight away by the sun, which, to be honest, has pretty mixed um, history in terms of reporting on, on climate change. This is just to quickly show you just that, just to, this is 2000 to 2020. This is some tracking that the University of Colorado Boulder do. You can, you can see the URL at the bottom of the, the slide. This is the UK's, this is quite, it's quite crude analysis in a way. It's just tracking mentions of climate change and global warming in, in, in text within newspaper articles. But it does show you the journey in the UK. So what you can quite clearly see is you can see that Copenhagen peak here at the end of 2009. This little moment here is AR4, the IPCC false report, and Al Gore and co and the IPCC winning the Nobel Prize. Um, then we go through a bit of a dip. Um, actually, in, intriguingly, notice how there isn't really a, a moment of the climate, the year or so of climate, what we would remember as the climate gate coverage in the moment when some emails were stolen from the University of East Anglia, which caused a big kind of what people remember as a media furor. It doesn't actually show up that much in that period. If we skip forward, we get to the Paris Agreement at the end of 2015. Then we have a, a bit of a drop off, even when Trump is being elected, et cetera, et cetera, and pulling out of, and saying he wants to pull out the Paris Agreement. And then we see this extraordinary surge in the last year. So we have, we have the heat wave of 2018, the summer heat wave. Then we have um, effectively this surge of the climate strike, Greta, Extinction Rebellion. This last year has been historic high in the UK. And then we see this sudden, the last two months, just falling off a cliff, which is due to the dominance of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, just a slightly different picture in the US. Slightly different, but it, it shows some similar peaks. You've got Copenhagen here, you've got the fourth IPCC report and the Nobel Prize. Um, you, but you've got a very different um, rising trend here in the US. You notice how Paris isn't really a big deal in terms of the newspaper coverage, but Trump announcing that he wants to put standing on the, the Rose Garden lawn outside the White House saying he wants to pull out of um, um, and the Paris Agreement. And then the similarly, you've got this rise over there so now i just want to quickly talk about carbon brief and what we do so i've been editing carbon brief since 2015 um and what we do at carbon brief effectively is what we call kind of explainer journalism so we go it's very different to the type of journalism i would have done at the guardian um where i would typically do much shorter sort of 800 word a thousand word articles um in often in quite breezy chatty sort of style in terms of talking to readers. This, the, the type of journalism we do at Carbon Brief is almost like a bridge between that and academic writing. Um, so we're, we're trying to communicate the latest and explain um, the latest climate science in to an audience which is already quite specialist and I think it's very important when in communicating climate change to always be very aware of who your audience is so our content is not written for um, um, Greta Thunberg's followers for example but I'll come on to that in a minute to explain why, why that's significant our, our audience is typically other journalists policy makers um, NGOs, other academics. So it's quite a specialist audience. But what we do a lot of, which is this, is this slide highlights, is we do a lot of data visualization. We find because climate change and, and, and energy and emissions, etc., is so data rich, it really lends itself very, very nicely to data visualization. And this, this has been a hugely popular article for us and still does enormous traffic for us. Um, and effectively, very, very quick shows you where the world's sort of 7,000 coal power stations are um, and also I can't show you here but it's on a timeline so you can show it growing over time um, but what happens is we our journalism and our form of communicating climate change 
sort of effects where you, when you publish things, it sort of goes out there into the wild, if you like, and we don't really um, know what will happen to it. So we have these kind of slightly extraordinary communication moments where just slightly randomly for no design or reason, Leonardo DiCaprio will suddenly pick up on one of our actually quite, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating piece of work where we effectively review, it's effectively a big literature review. We went through 70 odd papers and pulled out all the key metrics showing climate impacts at different temperatures and built it into a huge interactive, effectively a big scrollable table of information. But randomly, Leonardo DiCaprio came across it and tweeted it. So we've suddenly, in terms of communicating that bit of kind of almost raw literature review, suddenly it's just gone out there into this kind of huge new different audience that we would have no kind of control or design over. Similarly, we had an experience last year where some of our analysis was picked up and, and, and shown on the very, very popular John Oliver show in the US, Late Night, it's a comedy show. And, and another a very strange, but sort of, you know, wonderful in a way, kind of example of where quite dry analysis can suddenly springboard into a different, a different audience. And obviously Greta herself has tweeted and communicated quite a lot of our stuff actually, we've been quite surprised by that. Um, but it shows you how different people communicate our, our kind of journalism into different in, in different different ways um one thing we've just to finish on just one thing we've experimented a lot with over the last year is um is animations particularly for social media i'm just going to let this run for a little bit but this is effectively what we call a racing bar chart and this did very very well on us for, for us on twitter and facebook um, and actually was, we were just responding to a common talking point where people were saying, ah, oh, but the UK is only 2% of emissions, therefore in China's everything and we shouldn't do anything and blah, 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 which you often hear online and by politicians and things. But this was just putting in perspective, actually, until, as it just overtook there, 1914, the UK was actually the largest emitter. And this is historic cum cumulative emissions. And what it, it really puts it in perspective to see to see the emissions in this in this way, and it's obviously it's the accumulation of emissions, which is what counts in the atmosphere to, um, in many ways. But we we found in terms of communicating quite a complicated point. This was actually really really successful. And if you watch out for China, just watch just watch China coming now and look at the dates. So we're still in the 1980s, and look what happens in the 1990s. Um, it's not actually until this moment now, 1999, when China overtakes the UK, which is a point not many people realise, I don't think. And then look at China now as it as it develops. But the US is still way out in the lead. Um, it, if you want to call it a lead, I suppose. Um, just one, just one final slide, and this is also done incredibly well for us. This this animation, and we we did this partly as a response to the success of that racing bar chart before. I'm just going to hit play on this, so you can watch it as I as I talk. Now, this we estimate when we did a last count in January, this has been viewed almost 10 million times, and there's a single reason for that. It's because Greta Thunberg has facebooked and tweeted this about seven times we estimate and that it just shows you the enormous power and reach of her audience but it's it's interesting again i would argue this is actually it's, it's i think hopefully it's a nice treatment of quite a complicated point showing you different you know pathways etc cetera, etc cetera. you know this is quite chewy stuff this is coming straight out of the ipcc report the 1.5 report that came out a couple of years ago but it's an example of how we've tried to be a bridge between that quite dense, dry science and the sort of the world of Greta Thunberg and her followers. Um, but I'm just going to stop it there because I know we've, you know, it's, it's, um, we've, I think we've now got um, a bit of time for some questions, as I understand it. I'm sorry, I haven't been chat keeping track on on the chat the chat um, session. So I'll maybe hand over to maybe Ian and Nick to see if they just want to moderate this next bit. Yeah, thanks Leo. Yeah, we've, we've got um, some questions come in now. Um, 
you've been watching them. Chloe, do you want to pose the questions or shall we do? No, <laughs> okay. Well, you go well, for the, it, you go for it. Yeah, okay. Well, the first question that came in is, is, is a good one. It's from, from Maureen Fourier. I apologize, apologize if I pronounce your surname wrong. Um, and it poses the question, should the media have a responsibility not to publish climate skeptic articles? Um, given that there's almost universal acceptance that you know our, our impacts are damaging the climate, um, so would you like to? Yeah, that, that that's a fantastic question. Um, it gets into all kinds of deep, almost sort of meta philosophical questions about free speech and rights and all the rest of it. But I think on a basic level, I I would argue um, it, it actually raises the question of what I haven't mentioned yet is the kind of question of false balance, which has been a problem for the media for for many years relating to 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 climate change. This idea that that we're, we're trained as journalists to to construct our news articles, particularly around a dynamic where you give typically a kind of he said, she said dynamic where you give you know both sides of the argument and then the reader can make up their mind. And that implies a kind of 50 50 breakdown in terms of the argument. Now, the problem with climate science is there clearly isn't a 50-50 breakdown between you know, a bunch of scientists over there and a bunch of scientists over there, and they have you know, opposing views. Yet, as the, the dynamics of journalism, particularly broadcast journalism, um, where you have a sort of panel discussion or something on TV, is that you have two talking heads. Now, who do you invite? Do you invite two climate scientists who effectively agree with each other, except for the, you know, the edges? Um, or do you invite on a climate scientist who, who quote, represents the science and, and then say a talking head politician who doesn't like the look or smell of the policy implications of that science and therefore you then have what makes good TV because you have two people raging away and debating, but it actually it's, it's very misleading to the audience because it suggests that there is, there is a 50-50 debate about the science. Um, in terms of whether you would actually not, I'm just thinking of the question, was it, was it that we sh the media shouldn't ever have a climate skeptic or was it that journalists shouldn't quote climate skeptics? I can't quite remember. Yeah, I, I think it was that one of balance. I know the, the BBC has been, I think, criticised for this a bit, haven't they? That um, given that whatever the statistics are, 99% of people accept that this, this thing is happening. Um, you know, is it irresponsible almost to publish any articles that that, that challenge that? And, and the example given in the question actually is, is about tobacco and, and would anybody publish a, uh, an article arguing that uh, tobacco was not bad for your health? But the tobacco is a good example because it effectively the climate skeptic playbook, which I referred to, which has been going since the late 80s, arguably with, you know, think you know fossil fuel funded think tanks putting out reports that undermine the science and therefore the journalists get sent that report they then report on that and then creates the headline blah 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 that was invented effectively that was that playbook was set out in the 1960s by the tobacco industry and they and effectively the same the same it was the, the same dynamic is being recreated again i think I think I do think that the media, particularly if you go back to that Daily Express front page I showed you from 2009, where a hundred reasons why climate change is is natural, and I, and the reason why I don't think that headline would ever appear again, certainly not in the UK media, um, in the national media, is I do think things have moved on and things are much more positive now when it comes to that. I just don't think um, um, an editor would 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 commission and run that front page right now due to the um, way that this whole thing has moved on. And I think there's, I, I don't really have time to get into it here, but there's a big difference between the correspondents and the reporters and the specialist reporters who report on climate change every day and their editors and the understanding of their editors. And I, 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 I hate butting in, but I'm going to butt in at this point just because we've got, we've got 18 other questions. So we'll try and get through it. Okay, have a bit more time at the end. But th this is an interesting one from Lorenzo Minola. Um, you mentioned that media follow most of the time the occurrence of extreme weather events. Um, so the point is, the climate gets into the news after extreme weather events. But climate change is a long term, gradual change. Uh, and I think the question here relates to increasing awareness that it is a gradual creeping thing and, and perhaps my um, reference to Glasgow and Barcelona earlier on is, is, is kind of 
an example of that. But but yeah, I mean, it should, if we don't get any extreme events for a little while, does it fall off the radar? And, and how do we address that? I guess. Yeah, well, it's 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 it, it it is a it is a factor of climate change that we it is a sort of almost like a Groundhog Day story. It, it's you have these incre if if climate change plays out as the way scientists project, and it is a kind of incremental deepening and worsening of some of these extremes and impacts over the next few decades. As a journalist, that's a very challenging story to tell because you know journalists want drama um, and you know you know storylines etc to 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 sell into their readers because he, he, it's too you know it doesn't make a great headline where it says you know things are incrementally just a little bit different than they were from you know last time but anything where human lives are being impacted will clearly generate generate news um but it, it, it is a challenge with, you know, I've had this discussion with editors before where you go, you pitch a story to them and they go, but particularly with a new study. So a new study will come out and it will say X is happening to the West Antarctic ice shelf or something's happening to the Amazon or whatever, or these are projections. And the, the editor will often come back and say, didn't we have a study like that about only about six months ago? And you go, well, yeah, it is kind of similar. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. It was, it, but the, these findings are actually... A little bit different and they go well that's not enough a little bit different not enough for me i've got i've got you know this great sports story to put on my front page tomorrow i you know i don't want a little bit different so right i'm, I'm gonna buy it again one, one more question is probably all we have time for so this is a, a nice one and a, and a very personal one at the moment from darini partha sarathi i hope i have that something like correct um given the huge drop in climate change coverage in the last few months um, and the coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you perceive journalists will cover climate change in the next year and beyond, particularly to keep the drumbeat for political action, even as leaders and nations are dealing with the pandemic? In other words, there's a giant distraction and an urgent one. How do we keep this on, on the radar? And being, uh, I, think, I think covering the science might be challenging in that, in, within the the, the shortened or the, the reduced bandwidth that journalists now have in terms of covering other stories other than the COVID-19 crisis. But I do think there's a massive opportunity and there's a massive story building right now. And that's about the stimulus packages that all the governments around the world will um, put forward to try and um, um, reignite their economies. And there is already quite clearly a political uh, momentum building amongst some of the European um, leaders, etc., around so-called green stimulus. Uh, let, let's 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 you know out of this crisis. Let's you know make a positive and let's try and kill two birds with one stone. Let's deal with this COVID nineteen crisis and the economic implications, and also forget that we're also in the middle of a climate crisis. And we maybe if we if we're cute and we're smart about this, we can combine the two things and look for um, gr green oriented or climate friendly kind of stimulus packages. And that's already really building as a talking point. And I think that will become an increasingly interesting story. We're also having the dynamic that people around the world are seeing what cleaner cities suddenly look like with less air pollution. Um, and I think that will, and people, we're already seeing certain European cities laying out their urban infrastructure differently in terms of cycling lanes and things like that and i think all of that and you know what we're doing right now and this, this you know these zoom calls and reduced commuting i think all of that is going to give journalists a lot of fodder to feed on in terms of we, we probably do need to wrap stories. up but yeah but I, I mean i think it you know in some way it can be a potential great opportunity can't it because i mean you know my lifestyle has become a lot greener in the last month or two than probably everybody on this call that's that's Just on a very quick final point next year we're also now going to have the delayed cop 26 in glasgow and it looks like it might also combine with exactly the same time pretty much within days or weeks of when AR6 the, the, the first working group report comes out for the, the next IPCC report so you've got that big moment in the calendar which editors could be persuaded to think hey this is really interesting we've got a, a sort of double whammy moment of climate change you know back on the back on the agenda we've even seen the BBC this week on Wednesday devoting a day towards towards climate towards climate coverage where they put out um quite a lot of extra climate change coverage so i don't 
it, it feels weird and it's, a, it's an odd time to suddenly see that coverage reduce in the way that that chart showed. But I, I do think there's a lot of opportunities to, for journalists and communicators to, to almost um, kind of use this moment to sort of keep communicating around it and, and sort of reorient, reorient it a bit. Okay, on that note, thanks very much, Leo. Really fascinating stuff. And we'll have more time for questions at the end. So do, do hang around if you're able to. Ian, would you like to introduce our next speaker? Yeah, I was just thinking that idea of COP in Glasgow with, it, with that Glasgow, Glasgow weather that uh, Nick was talking about. Maybe we'll get some <laughs> Barcelona weather for that. So our next speaker is uh, Yuta Thilun del Pozo, um, who is a, a senior scientist in, in hydrometeorology, but she leads the scientific development unit at the Joint Research Centre at the European Commission. This is a unit that um, kind of fosters cutting edge research and innovation across the, the thematic programs, uh, Art and Science, the JRC Clear Writers Network, Collaborative Doctoral Partnership in the new EU Academy. So it's that interface between research and policy that we're going to now. So uh, over to you, Yuta. Yes, okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me and I'm going to turn off my, uh, stop my video so that hopefully my voice will come through. Um, yes, so our presentation is called Talking With Not At. And my co-authors are Adrian Ekels, Paul Hearn, Annemette Jensen Foreman, and Jan Krovitschko. And I'm going to show you examples from each of their research that we do in terms of communication. So if you go to the next slide, I'm very happy that uh, Leo was the first presenter um, because obviously what I'm presenting goes top notch on, on his presentation. So science communication and climate change, if you look at the headlines, like climate change is largest science communication failure in history, or what's wrong with the way we communicate climate change. I think these kind of headlines point to the fact, why do we not reach out to society sufficiently and to policymakers to make change happen? We know that there is an issue. It seems most people understand, but yet there is no action following our communication. And I think Leo has had a you know, brilliant presentation on that, how it's been communicated over time. But the question remains, why are we not going to have um, uh, an impact? If you go to the next slide. So what we would like to talk to in this presentation is that scientists have a responsibility in providing support to the policymakers and society because policy making ultimately is about shaping our future and i think some scientists are still not so aware of that because they see the policy maker as the kind of people that don't understand anything anyway and why should i talk to them and they should read my reports but policy making is about setting how we live in the future when the policies start taking impact and effect. So it's really important that we provide our support there, that we give the right data and evidence so that those policy can be shaped properly. But if society is not taking them up, they're not fine with the policies or they're disrespecting them, then there is no impact and there's again a problem. So policymakers and society are essential also for the scientists. And in order to reach that, we must, continue to do the excellent research as well, but also communicate, communicate with policymakers and society. And Leo showed the communication part from the side of journalism and the media. And I would like to give a little bit example of how we come from the, the science side. So what's our own responsibility there? Next slide. And I would like to start with a quote from Bruno Latour. Bruno Latour is a philosopher, sociologist, and anthropologist, a French one, uh, in Pont France. And he be, uh, became famous by 2017, so a few years ago, with his science wars. And I quite like the quote that he gave in this uh, article in the science magazine is, you know, there are large groups of people that are living in a different world with different realities, where, for example, the climate is not changing. So these are the people in the echo chambers that only communicate amongst themselves, and they will be climate deniers, whatever facts you present, because they are not even listening to them. So if you want to have a common reality, we need to have common facts. So we need to create a common knowledge base between scientists 
you know, journalists, communicators, policymakers, and society. So we can really not separate the science from politics. And policymakers are not politicians, but policymakers are important link between politicians who ultimately create the action and the scientists and society. Now, I think um, what he said that scientists need to win back respect. This was a discourse we would have had maybe three, four months ago, that there are so many people that are disrespectful of expert advice. They're not considering that. And I think we have seen in the uh, COVID-19 crisis how this has changed in an instance with the crisis. You have more epidemiologists on television now than ever, than politicians. And this is really important because in the crisis, people turn to the experts for advice. But I think we have to be aware that this can also backlash at scientists. If now the economic crisis hits, there is a risk or a danger that then society will turn around and saying, oh, we got bad advice from the scientists. You know, we should not listen to them. So I think as a science community, we have to be really attentive that this is not happening and we should make, um, you know, we should, we should uh, take the opportunity, the window that has opened now to go back to, to society, not only on COVID-19, but also with the science communication and value in what we have and what we can communicate. Next slide. So this is a really messy and horrible slide and it's on purpose like that because what I wanted to show here is how complex that interaction is. It is as difficult and complex as many people imagine it to be. And we would like to promote that it's not just a science policy interface, but that we should talk about the science policy society triangle. And the reason we want to be promoting this is because society, and of course also other stakeholders, are really drivers because they voice concerns. So they will feel that there is not enough employment. They feel the impacts of climate change, maybe in a much more diffuse way. And they are voicing these concerns. These concerns reach the policymaker and the policymakers then address the question to the scientists and saying, hey, we have a problem. You know, what should we do? And often scientists don't understand the questions because they may not have the, the the link to the society to really understand where do these concerns come from and where does this all need to go? What questions should I really answer? The questions are sometimes too diffuse. And so in that sense, it's really important that these feedback me mechanisms exist. If you go to the next slide, we can of course simplify that graph a lot. And then when we start simplifying and seeing how does society work, how does policy making work, and how does science work, we see that there are very easy hooks where you can link from one to the other. So society, again, there's a lot of prejudice that the, you know, the citizens are the ones that need to be taught and they need to be told. But in fact, society is a huge reservoir of tacit and formal knowledge that we need to tap into. And I'm coming back to that. So this knowledge that is driving, um, setting kind of an agenda by voicing concerns, then comes to the policymakers who need to set an agenda and turn to scientists to develop theories, data and modeling so that policies can be formulated and that can go back to society. So that triangle is complex, it's important. And what is key in this, so if you go to the next slide, is of course communication. That is how we link up between the different communities and we need to find ways to do that. Now, I'm really glad that Leo did not show the polar bear in his presentation because the polar bear, for example, is a sign that with a single image, you can convey the impact of climate change in a way that is touching our hearts and our values, right? So it's like this poor polar bear is dying because of climate change. It's an extremely powerful image, but at the same time, it has put climate change very far away from most of us. It's something that's affecting the polar bears somewhere in the Arctic, but hey, we live in the, in the mid-latitude, so we are not touched by that. So there is really a two-sided sword to how we communicate and what images we use. And it's important to understand the psychology behind our communication. Next slide. So at the JRC, 
we are now going to give examples from my co-authors uh, and we started looking in a research project at a paradigm shift in communication. Big data and artificial intelligence have been a game changer, in particular to how we see society. So society is now not just a receiver of our information, but it has become an active data provider in a sense that now there is a multi-directional data and information sharing, and that can allow the citizen to be empowered and to shape the policies in their local or regional environment, or even link it to global environment. So we really need to understand how does this multi-directional data and information sharing work so that we can have the best impact on the local policies. And it really allows us to construct this common knowledge base so there is going to be there are common databases that people can connect to extract information and that has been quite a game changer but we still need to understand how we can make the best use of that so that we're not running into the wrong direction and of course we have to remember that we are increasingly going from face to face to smartphone to smartphone and that of course changes the way we communicate shorter messages clearer messages a lot more with images and so linking back to the polar bear, it's important what images we use. We're also looking, of course, at uh, what is higher up on the horizon. So this is a research project in our Center for Advanced Studies. There are many biotech solutions to nonverbal communication that uh, may not be sci-fi anymore. For example, Alexander Valayame, he designed a neurocinema where the audience is determining what they see on screen. So there is a direct influence to what we see, which is quite a fascinating research. The next example I want to set is in the next slide, is communicating clearly, and that's not infantilizing. And that goes back to a question that was in the chat before, maybe that scientists feel misrepresented by journalists. So we created a JRC Clear Writers Network that was a pilot just two years ago. And since one year, it's an active network where we provide tailored training to scientists how to write clearly and to train them which type of document needs what kind of messages and how we do this. That, you know, who is the audience is important. That was already mentioned also by, by Leo. But also, to what level of clarity and simplification can you go down? And we do this because otherwise the scientific developments that we have can really go to waste if the policymakers do not understand them and we risk alienating our citizens. Now, I'm saying policymakers do not understand them. I don't want to blow into this horn of prejudice that policymakers don't understand. It's simply that they have so much information to digest because it's not only the scientists they talk to. There's also other sources. There are lobbyists, there's economists, there are... Uh, NGOs, so they have very little time and they don't have the time to go through a report of 400 pages. So we need to be clear and concise. And we saw that within one year, really, we achieved better quality documents. For example, executive summaries have really improved and we got within a one year of the network really positive feedback. And what we learned in that is that scientists are often quite jealous of their texts. So the moment a science communicator gets them in the hand, they feel that their texts are infantilized or dumped down. And it's really important to understand that we cannot use the same communication in the same detail to different audiences. So if you don't want science communicators to take our texts and dump them down, well, then we have to be clear from the beginning as scientists and communicate clearly. And there is a very quick take up on the uh, training and a very quick take up by the scientists to see once they have you know communicated more clearly oh we can do this and so there's a, a very steep learning a very quick learning next slide talking with not at also extends to our training so uh, typically when we have training it be classroom training so you have a trainer that talks or gives information or we put on the web PowerPoints or um, videos that talk at people. And whenever we communicate in text or through data portals and apps or in training, we need to put people into focus. And that means also in terms of training sessions, we need to make it an interactive learning experience. So at the commission, 
we are now developing an EU academy, spearheaded by the JRC. I had hoped that it would already be open, but the prototype should be open from July onwards. It's called the um, EU Academy, where we try to promote this interactive learning that people can go back, ask questions, and to be available to the audience. Uh, for example, in the chat functions, and I think at EGU we see how great this can work, that you can provide information uh, back to the audience, even if you are distant and far away. And we are exploring on that, and we are really hoping that this will be a game changer in how, as a policy institution, European Commission, we can interact with the citizens. Next slide. However, what I would really like to, to make a stand now is how we can engage with the public in general. And at JRC, we've been experimenting since four years now by bringing artists into the JRC to work with our scientists. And it's not using artists to illustrate our work. It is really to bring artists into the JRC to start working from the beginning on a new project. So we co-create pieces of science and art that are then elaborated over several months and then exhibited during an exhibition. Next slide. And I'm now going to show two uh, examples before concluding. So this is an example of Alexander Peter Hensel. He's a professor in Berlin, an artist also, and his installation is called Interactive Big Data Sculpture Dealing with Human-Induced Climate Change. It was exhibited in our last exhibition in the Resonances 3, which was on big data, artificial intelligence, and digital transformation. And he created out of a, a data set of temperature, so it's daily temperature for a one year data set, a virtual reality. And when you put on the goggles, you then step into the data set. So the data set is all around you. You're inside it, you're in the center of the globe and the temperature is around you. And what you would see is this slightly gray and black um, distribution of temperature, how it's evolving over time. However, as you move in this virtual reality space, the more you move, the more you excite the system. And eventually this light gray, white, black shading becomes darker and even red. So you see on the right hand side is red block. And in fact, the system even starts coming down on you. So it's a 3D, it's a three dimensional experience that you start feeling attacked by this atmosphere around you. And this is a personal interpretation, but you start feeling that something is coming down on you. And so within 10, 15 minutes, the spectator can, so the, the participant will see that this environment that we perceive as the atmosphere starts being really hostile. And then you have this kind of almost like arrows and flashes coming down on you with this red, really glowing red temperature set. And you turn around and in your back you have the same. So you cannot escape anymore. And you realize that this hostile environment has trapped you. And you realize that if you want to calm the atmosphere down, you need to stand still a long time before the system slows down. Meaning that it takes time until the system reacts and it takes a long time to calm down again. So within 15 minutes, extremely powerful illustration of climate change condensing within 15 minutes a very slow onset crisis. And it's not just about you know, the visualization here. There's really a power of a scientific concept behind and it's just married with the artistic beauty. Next slide. Um, and so what we need to do, or what we did in this experiment, was to accept the power of diversity. And in the installations, we let the arts do the talking, and then the scientific curiosity has followed. For example, there was a, a Gaia 5, it's a holographic image by Renate Quienberger, where she kind of merged the ocean coupling, atmospheric coupling, aerosol coupling, to the uh, outbreak of uh, big storms. So visually, she's connecting all of them and then participants that are listening to this or seeing this start asking questions, what does it mean? What is the problem with the oceans to a storm? And they see this very slow development of ocean temperatures, how it reacts to storms. And it's been an, a really an enormous uh, source of discussion and interaction and this safe space 
for scientists and artists to think free, to think with the public, has been a very um, experimental and very inspiring uh, experience. And we slowly start seeing the interest in JRC and the energy that we can get from that and how we can engage with the public. So final slide. Um, to conclude, I think what's essential is some people are saying, oh, so now we should only communicate to the public and forget about scientific publications. And of course, that is not the case. We need to keep doing the excellent science and we need to keep doing that within our scientific networks and publications and scientific jargon is part of that review. I think that's really important. We should not forget that. However, at the same time, we also should make our results accessible to policymakers when they need it the moment they need it, and not only three years later. And it needs to be a clear and easy to understand format because there is little time for them to digest the complexity otherwise. And we need to engage with society. And we need to understand their concerns behind the issues before we can really deliver our messages. Like the issue with the polar bear, we need to maybe understand a little bit of the psychology of values here. So there was a, we had a session on Tuesday where someone was saying, oh, I'm a bit worried about this because we have already a lot of work pressure and on top we should also communicate. And so my personal conclusion there is that unfortunately, yes, maybe that's what we need to do. We need to do everything. We need to play at the different uh, places. And um, maybe the COVID-19 crisis has showed us that that's possible because we can slow down. We can maybe do our science a bit slower, but more impactful by, um, by also communicating or by learning how to communicate. And once we learn, maybe it's much easier and faster. And I would like to thank you. And I hope that my voice was not broken up too much with my internet connection. Thank you. Thank you, Yuta. Yeah, we could hear you very clearly, actually. So it was, it was all good. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll kick off with a couple of questions, but if other conveners have spotted questions that they want to, to ask, please do jump in. Um, but if I can just navigate to where I've saved my questions, here we go. Um, yeah, a couple of people asked this one, actually, about um, trying to localize people's understanding of impacts. In other words, in, in one question, the example of the polar bear was given as, as being remote from people and their you know, local effects. How do you think we can more effectively communicate the problem with people so that it resonates uh, for, for them locally and means something to their daily lives? Yeah, I think we need to understand that, or maybe I turn my video off again. I have the feeling I'm interrupted again, sorry. Yeah, I think, we, I think what I'm trying to say is we need to interact with the society to understand what are their concerns in that particular region? You know, the image of the polar bear may be relevant for more northern people, but not so much for people in Germany, where at the moment we are facing maybe the third drought in a row rather than a polar bear image. So I think the understanding of the concerns of society is essential. And then we can target maybe also our research of our data towards that and in that part to communicate rather than general climate global change part communication but i think leo would have maybe also something to say on that to to um from his perspective uh, should we should we bring everybody into the chat at the end because we've got 15 minutes for, for conversation questions and answers at the end um another one that's come up a couple of times is around the use of artists, um, which is which is something I like. But um, somebody also mentions the thinking around using marketing and communication specialists um, to communicate more effectively. So, if you'd like to talk a bit more about that, the, the use of artists, perhaps broadening our, our view on what art means. I I put a question into a chat earlier this week around. Um, art and, and and i sort of hinted at a separation between art and mainstream movies and so on and somebody challenged back that they were all art but but really what are the most effective you know from the whole suite of art marketing communication movies you know popular culture what are the most effective avenues for us to to pursue i guess yes i think what i um what i would like to point out is that 
bringing in artists into science is not just about communication. You know, some people think, oh yeah, great, I get an artist to illustrate my results better or to make a nice movie out of that. I think artists are a lot more than that. Artists are an antenna into society. So if you bring them into our research from the beginning, we may be perceiving the concerns and the, um, the direction of our research much different. So we would maybe able to target from the beginning our research differently. Uh, we also may get inspired to look at, uh, at the issues in a different way. So it may help us to think out of the box. So I think it makes us a lot more effective as scientists. So I think artists play a much bigger role than only the communication. But then when we engage with uh, scientists, uh, sorry, when we engage with the public, I think what artists bring is the effect of culture. And, you know, we have certain scientific cultures, we have certain disciplines, and if you want to be effective, you need to cross into the different cultures. We need to start working together. And I think their artists can be an excellent bridge in doing that. They can help us in understanding the cultures, bridging to cultures, and um, yes, also communicating. Of course, this is an important aspect as well. We had, for example, a, a pair of artists, Lisa um, Ottogena and Joshua Portway, um, who got fascinated by Louis Fry Richardson, who was the first meteorologist designing a weather forecast. And he did it by hand. So during the Second World War, he was actually calculating a weather forecast by hand over a couple of years to make a six hour weather forecast. And he failed miserably because in his initial conditions were not right. And of course he ran into the uh, problem of uh, uh, you know, his, uh, his solution becomes, but they were fascinated by that. And they reacted that into a performance and they used it to show to make people aware of the slow onset of climate change and the uncertainties that you have in modeling and how important it is that we involve people in the discussion. And it was a very powerful performance and it was great. Okay. Uh, next so yes, question. bring in artists, bring in philosophers, bring in cultural elements. Yeah, okay. Next question, just before, because we, we, we need to move on to our next speaker very soon. So this one is around um, another bridge, the bridge to the policy side. Um, so I think the theme is really, there's been a lot of emphasis on helping scientists to be able to communicate with policymakers. And the challenge really is whether the policy side is putting the effort into communicating with the scientists. Is it a one-way thing? Should it be a two-way thing? Is it actually a two-way thing? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I mean, I think we have for years now promoted that scientists have to talk to policymakers and need to make the effort. Um, and I think the other way around is equally important. There are efforts like in um, community of users, where in the community of users, you will have a network where policymakers, stakeholders, public and scientists come all together. And I think it's in those community of users where the communication on all sides is important and the translation, and that's where we can make it happen. So yes, I, I agree. I think policymakers have to make an effort as well, but we should not underestimate the time pressure they're often in. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, talking about time pressures, I, I think we are actually on time, which is rare for things I'm involved in, in, in running or contributing to. So let's make the most of it. So I'll hand over to Ian to introduce our, our next speaker, who is, who is well, I, I'll let Ian do it. I, I won't take his steel his thunder. Ian. Well, our next speaker is, is I, I don't know what time, grotesque early time it is in the, in the East Coast of the USA, but it's fantastic to see Michael Mann. He's climatologist, professor of atmospheric uh, sciences and director of the Earth. Uh, System Cent uh, Science Centre at Penn State. Um, he researches and publishes um, right across climate science, um, climate change, sea level rise, climate modelling, carbon budget, human impacts, and, and is probably best known for his work reconstructing global temperatures over the last couple of thousand years. He's, he's the most public, most effective, most fearless kind of advocate of climate change in the policy realm and communicates across a whole variety of media, including a, a children's book, which is very cool. And last week he was elected to the US National Academy of Sciences. So it's a very good time to hear from, from Michael. Over to you, Michael. Uh, thanks so much, Ian. Uh, can everyone hear me, by the way? Excellent. Uh, thanks, Nick and, and the rest of the panel. Uh, it is a little earlier than I'm used to doing this, uh, about 5.50 a.m. here. 
but I'm excited to be part of this panel. Uh, there couldn't be a more important time to talk about the challenges that we face in communicating you know, what is arguably the greatest challenge we face as a civilization. And so I'm gonna give a, a presentation about the work that, um, well, you know, the message that I've been trying to communicate when it comes to the climate crisis. Uh, actually, I need to share screen, I believe. So let me do that, share screen. And is the presentation up? Great. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about what I uh, describe, what I call the, the new climate war, the new challenges we face in the current environment when it comes to uh, acting on the climate crisis. The science is compelling, compelling enough that we encounter relatively a little outright denial uh, of the science of climate change these days. Uh, you know, if you're a contrarian or a skeptic um, and you don't believe the climate model projections that we use, here is a projection uh, from uh, 1982 provided by ExxonMobil. Uh, ExxonMobil's own internal scientists correctly predicted both the increase in carbon dioxide concentrations that would occur in the following decades, and that happened in part because of their uh, efforts to prevent action on climate, to prevent a transition away from fossil fuels. They were able to predict quite accurately both the current CO2 concentration and the resulting warming from that. So these uh, projections, these estimates are robust. The impacts of climate change, uh, as I like to say, are no longer subtle. Uh, we see them play out in real time. Wildfires breaking out from the tropics uh, to the Arctic, the polar region of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and we talk a lot about the wildfires out west in the Western US, epic unprecedented wildfires in California in recent years. But as I speak to you, we have wildfires breaking out in Florida. Um, and that's relatively unusual. Um, that's a, a part of the Eastern US uh, that generally um, is wet enough to uh, be resistant to wildfires. But our own work uh, from a, a few years ago actually projects that uh, Florida will not only become uh, warmer, but also drier in the future because of human caused climate change. And this is sort of a glimpse of Florida's future that we're seeing play out right now. Um, and indeed, the impacts of climate change uh, play out in real time today in the United States with epic heat waves or the epic heat waves you've seen in Europe in recent years in January 2020, as if to remind us that uh, climate change continues apace. Even when we're distracted with other challenges like coronavirus, um, climate change hasn't stopped. Uh, this January was the warmest month on record globally. Well, uh, as I've said, um, the impacts are no longer subtle. Um, uh, they are the face of climate change, the unprecedented uh, heat waves and wildfires and floods and super storms and droughts that we see now playing out. As I like to say, it's not rocket science. Uh, you warm up the planet, you intensify the hydrological cycle, you alter the behavior of the jet streams, you're going to see unprecedented weather extremes, and that's what we're seeing. Now, I uh, recently spent a sabbatical in Australia, I actually went down there in December uh, to spend uh, roughly five months studying the impacts of climate change on extreme weather events uh, with uh, my colleagues at the University of New South Wales. As it happens, we didn't get much work done. Uh, I ended up spending my time talking about the impacts of climate change as they played out um, in uh, perhaps the most profound way ever um, in the country of Australia, which saw unprecedented heat and drought and bushfires that broke out uh, across the country in December, uh, January through early February of 2020. And so uh, what was a, a tragedy for Australia, um, nonetheless uh, did provide an opportunity to talk about the crisis that they face and to frame it properly. Um, the reason that these unprecedented wildfires, 
bushfires, as we call them down in Australia, were happening was because of climate change. Climate change exacerbated these uh, fires, um, made them more extensive in the area covered, uh, hotter, uh, more intense, and faster spreading, and obviously much more devastating. And that's just one degree Celsius. Imagine what four degrees Celsius uh, will do. Well, let me talk a little bit about the climate wars. Um, and I have, um, as uh, Ian alluded to, uh, found myself in the center of the fractious, uh, larger societal debate over climate change and what to do about it, uh, in substantial part because of the iconic hockey stick graph that we published um, now more than two decades ago. And so I have faced off with uh, congressmen in the United States who run powerful committees like the House Science Committee, um, who are in denial of the science of climate change, like Lamar Smith, um, whom I testified to a few years ago. And I just want to play that clip. Uh, according to an article that came out a few days ago in the journal Science, uh, Chairman Smith was on record at the Heartland Institute. This is a climate change denying Koch Brothers funded uh, outlet um, that has a climate change denier conference every year. And uh, Chairman Smith spoke at that conference. Dr. Mann, don't mischaracterize that. Well, let me, let me finish my... No, they do not say that they are deniers and you should not say that they are either. Well, uh, we, we can have that discussion. I'd be happy to. Let well, me finish be my statement. accurate in your description. Well, I, I stand by my statement. So can I finish my uh, uh, point? I'd like to reclaim my time. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, he uh, indicated at this conference that he, according to science, and I'm quoting from them, he sees his role in this committee as to a tool to advance his political agenda rather than a forum to examine important issues facing the U.S. research community. As a scientist, I find that deeply disturbing. Uh, Dr. Mann, who said that? Uh, this is according to Science Magazine, uh, one of the most respected um, and, outlets and, when it comes and to And who science. are they quoting? Um, this is the, uh, the author, uh, Jeffrey Mervis, who wrote that article. I I'd be happy to send to committee the, okay. uh, the article. Uh, that is not known as an objective writer or magazine. Well, it's Science Magazine. Yeah, that so uh, there you have it. Um, in the upside down world of climate change denial, uh, Science Magazine isn't an authoritative source uh, when it comes to matters of science. Um, fortunately, Lamar Smith is no longer chair of that committee. Um, he stepped down, uh, he's no longer in Congress and uh, Democrats now control the House Science Committee. Um, and in recent years, it has now returned uh, more to uh, the form that we expect of that committee. Uh, let me play another clip. This was uh, a national uh, Australian uh, panel uh, show that I did on uh, ABC. Mike, I, I'm really sorry to jump in. It's it's Nick Everard here. Um, just I think you may not have joined us at the point where we discussed this, but we're doing a 30 second silence at, 11, at 12, uh, 12 midday Central European time. So that's in about 40 seconds. So if, if this is a short clip, go ahead. Um, but if it's more than that, um, we, we're going to do a 30 seconds, which is, is it just in memory of, of loss of life and uh, thinking of peace and looking after the planet and each other. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, uh, 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 I'm pleased to, to be honoring that. And so I'll just stop now and we'll pick up um, when it's over. Okay, so should we take our 30 seconds from now so that, so that Mike's talk can, be, uh, can flow nicely afterwards? So I'm, I'm going to start counting now. Okay, S silence, please. Okay, thanks everybody. And, and sorry if that was sprung on you, Mike. It was something we, we discussed in, in the sort of pre-meet get together. So uh, yeah, pr please continue. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so uh, here is a, a clip from uh, the uh, popular uh, ABC show Q&A. Um, this was the first episode of the season uh, at the very beginning of February um, when Australia was still experiencing those unprecedented bushfires. 
and uh, this um, panel discussion uh, took place in Canberra, um, where uh, in fact there were bushfires that were threatening uh, the city of Canberra at that very time, at the time of, of this show. Um, one of the participants, uh, Jim Mullen, uh, is a, a former uh, senator, um, or actually is still a, a senator uh, from, from Australia, who, uh, uh, well, uh, I'll play the clip, um, actually denies uh, the evidence, uh, was calling into question the evidence that climate change was connected to these unprecedented bushfires, even though the, the scientific evidence uh, is indeed clear. You said you get information across your desk every day, yes. which leads you to doubt or be open-minded about the science. Yeah, I am what is that information? It. Oh, it's, a, it's a range of information which goes... <laughs> it's, it's a range of... Thank you. But it, sorry, it's, can we it's, just respectfully listen to this? Yeah, thank I'm you. Just trying to get to the bottom of this. What is what is the evidence that you are relying I'm on? I'm not relying on evidence, Hamish. I am saying... <laughs> You said it. You said it. But, but you said it. But, but this is this is why my mind is open. I would love to be convinced one way or the other. But to be prudent, what the government is doing is it's got a climate uh, uh, and emissions reduction policy, and it is a good policy, and it will mitigate risk to the maximum that it can. And where risk cannot be mitigated, it will it will adapt. And, and that's what we've got to work on, is my like yeah, no, Come on now, mate. Um, <laughs> and, and he's an American. Now, um, you know, you should keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so th that ended up being uh, one of the lighter uh, and more memorable moments of that discussion. Um, and I, I used humor to make a more serious point. Uh, that, um, you know, to say you're open-minded uh, about uh, a matter which in fact constitutes the overwhelming consensus of the scientific community uh, really isn't being uh, open-minded. Um, and so we still see in some circles uh, among some uh, politicians uh, in the United States and Australia, uh, in Europe and around the world, there is some st still, still some residual uh, basic denial, uh, if not of the the reality of climate change, of the impacts um, that it is now having. But we've largely uh, moved on from that now. And so we face what I call the new climate war, which as the evidence becomes so clear and denial becomes untenable, we see the forces of uh, delay and inaction turning to other tactics in an effort to prevent the action uh, that they seek to stop, um, action on climate the transition from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, the decarbonization uh, of our economy. Uh, so I call this in the new climate war. Um, and uh, it consists of, of soft denial. Um, for example, uh, the uh, Murdoch media in Australia um, found itself on the defensive uh, when it was continuing to publish articles denying the connection between climate change and the unprecedented bushfires. Um, and so they sort of pivoted, uh, in, in particular, their uh, columnist, a Andrew Bolt, who's a famous climate change denier, uh, sort of pivoting away from outright denial of the problem to, well, it's good for us. Um, you know, as if unprecedented uh, wildfires could somehow be good for Australia. And you saw them bring in people like Bjorn Lumberg, um, who calls himself the uh, skeptical environmentalist, but in fact, uh, he is a contrarian who is funded by fossil fuel interests to, if not deny the science of climate change, deny to deny the severity and the threat of climate change. And he was brought in by one fossil fuel uh, uh, funded organization to Australia as they were experiencing uh, these tragic bushfires to somehow deny that uh, it was connected to climate change. So you've got soft denial, then you've got delayism, delay, um, whether we're talking about Scott Morrison in Australia or some of our politicians here in the United States. Um, the idea that, okay, maybe climate change is real, but uh, we can just adapt or we will find technological solutions. So let's just continue to burn fossil fuels. Uh, let's continue with business as usual. Um, and each of these arguments, what they have in common is they lead us down the very same path of inaction. 
which is ultimately, as I like to say, when it comes to uh, the, the, the forces of inaction, uh, they don't care about the path you take to inaction. They just care about the destination. Deflection, uh, another technique, um, and I won't go into it because I don't have the time. Uh, there's a famous commercial uh, from the early 1970s that featured a crying Native American. Um, and it was about pollution and it was about uh, bottle and can litter. And it was telling us that we needed to be better stewards and to stop uh, you know, throwing away um, trash, uh, throwing bottles and, and cans. Um, uh, you know, uh, in, in, into, uh, um, you know, uh, across the, the countryside. And it was um, funded uh, by uh, some environmental organizations. Uh, they pulled out uh, of uh, their support within a year or so when they realized they had been had. What this really was, was a um, campaign that had been launched by the beverage industry, by Coca-Cola, to deflect attention from the need for a systemic solution, for example, uh, a bottle bill that would encourage people to recycle um, and reuse bottles and cans, to deflect attention from a systemic solution that would cost them money, instead towards the idea that individual action, personal action is the solution to the problem. And the fossil fuel industry is doing the same thing today when it comes to climate change. And often they get help from our mainstream media, uh, the New York Times, is literally littered with um, articles about how the solution to climate change is individual action. It's our diet. It's uh, what we do in our daily lives. Drive less. Um, eat a, you know, more, um, you know, uh, climate-friendly uh, uh, diet. Um, go vegan. Um, stop using plastic straws. And. Many of these things are things that we ought to do. Uh, they make us feel better. Um, they set a good example for others. But in fact, the emphasis on individual action is being used as a diversion away from the need for a systemic solution, which is putting a price on fossil fuels and incentivizing uh, renewable energy. And I've written a number of pieces about this in recent years. Um, and then there's doomism, uh, the idea that it's too late to do anything. Uh, humans will go instinct, extinct within 10 years, no matter what we do, um, is the claim by uh, Guy McPherson. Uh, and we see uh, popular magazine uh, articles, um, books about how climate change is essentially a lost cause. Uh, and as I said before, um, the forces of inaction don't care about the path that we take to inaction. They just care about the destination. And indeed, outright, um, you know, uh, the uh, sort of doom, uh, doomism uh, can lead us down the very same path of inaction as outright denial of the problem. And uh, recently, uh, if some of you may have followed um, this film that's just come out by Michael Moore, who's sort of a uh, progressive liberal icon in American politics, um, but uh, surprisingly has come out with a film now that uh, is essentially an attack um, on renewable energy. And it plays into all of these new climate war tactics that I've been talking about. It pervades, uh, it pervades doom and gloom, uh, represents climate uh, action um, as sort of a lost cause, um, uh, argues that the only uh, way we can solve this solution is by population control, which is deflection, by the way, away from systemic solutions price on carbon, incentives for renewable energy towards individual behavior. Um, and so even though uh, Michael Moore is sort of a, a liberal icon in American politics, his latest film plays right into the tactics um, of the new climate war. And I just wrote a, a commentary about this in Newsweek uh, magazine yesterday that you can find online. So how do we win the new climate war? And I realize I'm running uh, a little behind here, so I'll do this quickly. Um, you know, the solution is already in front of us. Uh, we have the solution, um, renewable energy. Uh, we have um, the, the necessary technology to decarbonize our economy. It's just a matter of putting the right incentives in place. Um, and there are all sorts of amazing stories that have played out over the past uh, few years 
um, demonstrating that that transition is already happening. The transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy is already happening. Uh, we talk a lot these days about flattening the curve. Well, we flattened the, the carbon emissions curve. Um, in 2019, um, there was actually a decrease in uh, carbon emissions from electricity generation. And we know the, the uh, IEA, International Energy Agency, um, tells us why it happened, um, in substantial part because of the transition that's already uh, underway, away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. So we're already on the right path. We just need to accelerate our, 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 uh, our, our trajectory, and we need to not only flatten that curve, but we have to bring it down uh, dramatically. Um, but there are some reasons for cautious optimism uh, that children's uh, uh, climate movement, which has really changed the conversation. Uh, I think it's a, a critical development which has helped recenter uh, the climate crisis um, as the, the really the, um, the moral challenge uh, of our time. Um, but these kids are actually under attack by the very same fossil fuel interests that we've been talking about. Um, who see them as the greatest threat to their bottom line, to our continued addiction to fossil fuels. Um, and so they're under attack and we have to be out there. We can't uh, put this on uh, the children. Uh, we have to be out there um, making sure that we don't squander the opportunity that they have provided to potentially finally cross that threshold uh, and see the sorts of action that we need to see. Um, uh, fundamentally, uh, you know, this is about what sort of planet we want to leave behind for our children and, and grandchildren. Uh, and there's still time to make sure that we don't leave behind a degraded planet, that that not be our legacy. Um, and I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Thanks for getting up super early to join us. And uh, yeah, apologies for probably drop, dropping the silence on you, but um, I think that was a, an important thing for us to to take time, particularly at this point. So, so now I, I think some, some questions um, for, for Michael to answer initially, and then hopefully we'll have a bit of time for, for a more general Q&A for, for the whole panel. So um, again, I'll invite the conveners, the other conveners, if they've got questions they want to ask, you know, please, please do jump in. But otherwise, I'll, I'll start us off with one, which um, it's surprising almost that it's come up so, so late in the day, but fake news. Um, but related to that, how scientists can use social media. And, and I just wanted to chip in. Uh, I forget who mentioned it now. Was it, uh, was it Leo? Uh, but uh, talking about Leonardo DiCaprio retweeting something. Um, so fake news and how scientists can use social media. And can we use high profile people that, you know, a lot of people respect and listen to, to help us move that message out there? Yeah, thanks. So it was Leo on Leo then. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, you know, uh, social media uh, today is an important mode of, of communication, especially when you're trying to reach uh, younger audiences. Um, um, there is uh, an interesting sort of cultural divide. Um, there's still a generation of uh, scientists who don't feel comfortable in that environment, uh, in part, uh, I think, because it it, it creates a collision of worlds, uh, your personal world, your professional world, um, and, and, and your world as a potential participant um, in a larger societal conversation. I personally think that it's critical for scientists um, to use social media as a way of extending their voice. And if you're not on social media, you're going to, um, you know, you're losing out on an opportunity. Um, to speak to a very important um, and, and uh, in somewhat younger uh, audience in particular. Um, I, you know, my role um, in, in that space, uh, as I see it, is to try to communicate uh, the latest science and the implications of that science and the policy dimensions and the political dimensions uh, of the problem. I'm not afraid to sort of engage um, across the, the, the spectrum of, um, of, of issues um, when it comes to climate change. Uh, but I also see um, it as an opportunity to engage and take advantage of uh, other opinion leaders who are out there. Um, and friends of mine, uh, like uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, um, who I've met and, and know, um, uh, there are these other voices out there who have much larger audiences. And to the extent that you can influence them and provide them with information, and they can use that information then to, to reach their um, audiences, um, that's a critical opportunity that we have as well. And so I would encourage um, 
uh, scientists who aren't on social media, who aren't on Twitter, to give it a try. Uh, you can start out by lurking. You know, you don't have to be out there um, and, and, and public. You can just sort of observe for a while, uh, get your feet wet, um, and then ultimately, um, maybe you'll, you'll feel the opportunity to, to engage. Because if we're not out there um, and we're not participating in this discussion, as I've often said, we leave behind a vacuum, a vacuum that will be filled by other voices who often have an agenda uh, to advance, um, which is not uh, the, the um, agenda um, that aligns with the better interests of the public when it comes to this crisis. Sorry, I was muted there for just a moment, but um, yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, the next question I, I will direct to you. Um, it is around speaking out um, and specifically, uh, can you comment on how speaking out as a scientist and, and starting to engage in discussions close to politics can affect one's career as a scientist? Yeah, thanks. Well, it's a, it's a valid uh, question. And, and I'll tell you, um, uh, uh, to me, uh, you know, one of my great heroes um, was uh, Carl Sagan, um, who, who passed away um, now uh, a couple decades ago. Um, he was a great scientist, but he was also perhaps the greatest science communicator uh, of our generation. Uh, he passed away uh, uh, far too early. Um, and he also made fundamental uh, contributions to our science. The faint early sun paradox in paleoclimate, one of the great still not entirely satisfactorily uh, solved, um, satisfyingly uh, solved problem. Um, Carl Sagan was the one who sort of uh, uh, brought that, um, that, 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 uh, that, that problem um, to light and, and proposed uh, solutions to it. Um, it's part of the introductory textbook of e every Earth system history um, uh, text. And uh, Sagan was, um, was a great scientist, but he didn't get into the National Academy of Sciences. He was uh, blackballed from the National Academy of Sciences by a relatively small number of colleagues who felt that um, somebody who spends so much time engaging in public outreach um, and, and simplifying the science for the public somehow can't be deserving of being in the academy. I think it was a, a tragedy. It was one of the great injustices um, in modern scientific history that, uh, that he was blocked from making it into the academy. Um, last week, I was inducted into the National Academy of Sciences, um, and uh, I'm honored uh, to, to have uh, you know, found myself um, uh, uh, with, with that invitation to join the academy. Um, and it was satisfying to me more than anything else, because it seems to be a recognition now by my fellow scientists that there is a role for us engaging in the public discourse. I have um, you know, spent much of my time in recent years, much of my time and effort in public outreach. Um, and I've uh, often um, you know, weighed in vigorously um, when it comes to contentious matters that are at the center of the climate crisis. Um, and I've been involved in the politics. Um, and so the fact that uh, that didn't prevent me from being accepted into the National Academy, to me, speaks volumes about how far we've come. Um, that, in fact, the scientific community recognizes the importance, not in all of us, but in at least many of us, um, engaging with the public. And, and that's now rewarded. It's now rewarded by uh, our fellow scientists because they recognize the importance of it. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times called, uh, If You See Something, Say Something, which is borrowed from our Department of Homeland Security, um, but it actually has um, resonance, I think, when it comes to science outreach. And, and it's the point that I made earlier. If we are not out there informing this conversation about the greatest challenge that we face as a civilization, we leave behind a vacuum that will be filled by voices um, uh, promoting misinformation and disinformation, an agenda of short-term economic financial interest rather than the longer term good of us and our planet. All right, thank you for that response. Um, we've only got 10 minutes left, so I'd like to kind of kick this open now to, 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 the, whole, to the whole panel of speakers. Um, and with one specific question, and, the, and then you know, we, can, we can see how it flows from there, but the specific one is on biodiversity loss. Um, and, and this one resonates with me and I'm sure with many other people because arguably carbon is a little abstract and temperature change is maybe a bit gradual and not everyone sees it. But 
Um, I, I, the, the, the question actually quotes, um, I think it's something from a movie or something like this, but anyway, it says uh, th there was a prediction that a, a mass extinction was happening and says, we found that 26 pages of news items were more important than the extinction of life on the planet. It, you know, is biodiversity loss and other indicators like that of harm to the planet potentially a more powerful tool? Because uh, everybody, you know, most people love animals and we don't want to kill them, hopefully. Everybody, whoever wants to go first. Go on, Leo, we haven't heard from you for a while. <laughs> um, no diversity loss. It's, it's interesting, we at Carbon Brief, we obviously when there's a big paper that comes out and it, it focuses on habitat loss or biodiversity loss, we instinctively think, well, that's gonna be interesting, that's gonna be interesting to our readers. Um, and we do we do cover those from time to time. Sometimes around iconic species. Sometimes around you know key well known habitats, the Amazon, Borneo, whatever. Um, and it, it's not exactly clear always what the the magic source is for what makes uh, an article of key interest. Sometimes those articles do really well. Sometimes they don't. And there's a few there's a few things that go into the into the pot to, for for their success. I think. Um, I think. Can I just chip in the word emotion at that point? Somebody asked this question, I think. Um, but is that perhaps what's lacking? And, and I know it's very significant in this country uh, with the Blue Planet series, and, and you know that raised awareness of plastic enormously. And it was quite emotive, and there was a science discussion about it. But you know, it was seeing the impact on the animals. I think I think that's right. That I think there's a, there's a, the way that we would report something at Carbon Brief, which is sort of quasi-academic sometimes compared to how I would have done it if I was still at The Guardian, where we would use very different visuals, very different headlines, etc. That is a crucial part of the, the formula. So, for example, I know that where, when I was at The Guardian, for example, anything we ever published about bees and the threat to bee populations always did enormous traffic because people love and are obsessed about bees, um, particularly Guardian readers and the threat to the wider implications of what that means for pollinating all of our crops, you know, and what it, it, beyond just the cuteness of a bee compared to whether they're going to provide us with all of the crops we need and except for the pollinated crops. So there are, there are certain things and certain triggers, certain species that are triggers, um, um, et cetera. We, we've, we've heard already about the, the issue of communicating around polar bears, for example, and that is famously a case study in climate communications where it, that doesn't necessarily connect with people because it's there, you know, who's ever actually seen a polar bear in, in, in real life themselves. And why should we care about these, you know, white bears wandering around and, in, you know, near the North Pole, an area where we'll never go. So you have to try and bring things back to the here and now. So I think that's partly why bees connect um, particularly particular species. But I think you're right to highlight um, emotion and bringing it back always to habitats and environments and species that have that chime directly with people in the here and now. Yeah, thank you. I was grinning momentarily because I had my bee mug for my morning coffee this morning, but it's not on the table in front of me anymore. But Yuta, I'd like to bring you in on that one. Do you have any, any thoughts on the, on the subject of emotion and how we communicate and how it can help? Yes, I think that is why we see bringing artists in has a lot of power because artists more naturally touch on the values of people. So you convey a message differently than through words and graphs and numbers, but through different ways, like through images or to other um, means. But I would like to make another point. And I think, you know, if you look at the ozone hole, in the ozone hole, it was relatively simple. There was an issue. Then we knew there were a few substances. They could be reduced and then we had an action. I think in climate change, it's a lot more complicated. And I think that is also the difficulty because for almost every action that you propose, you can find a counter argument. Like you said, reduction of CO2. And I may have been lost here. Um, Show my video. So reduction of CO2 and going fully electric, for example, has a lot of other implications on the policy side. Um, you know, there are rare materials that are mined in countries that do not respect child labor. Um, there are many issues around that. And we need to really look at 
the complexity of it all. And that I think is one of the issues in climate change. So we need to become transdisciplinary and learn to communicate across the different disciplines. Okay, thank you. And a question, cause and effect and sort of labeling and awareness. There's been a lot of talk about deniers in this, in the chat um, window and in the questions and answers. But I think there's an awful lot of people who are just numb. They don't really know. They don't really understand. And, you know, I do understand and I do care. But when I make my purchasing decisions, you know, if I know that this brand has half as much carbon in its manufacturer as that one, I, I would choose the one with half as much carbon. But that information is not available to me. You know, are, are there simple things that we can do or are they already happening some places in the world? But, you know, that when I go to buy a, a can of beer, I can see that this one is way less harmful to the environment than that one. You know, labeling, just simple communication, maybe almost compulsory. When, when, you, when you view video online, that has a carbon impact. Most people have no idea. Are we doing all we could just with simple labeling and communication of, of, of factual impacts? To, to the public because I think there's, a, there's an awful lot of people who are not deniers but who don't fully get it and, and just more information would help them. Anybody? Yeah, um, yeah I'm happy to, to weigh in on, on that matter and uh, you know my presentation um, I try to emphasize that while there's still some residual uh, denialism we've largely moved on uh, in, in, in large part because the impacts of climate change have become so obvious it just isn't credible um, to deny that it's happening. And so what we're encountering instead are these other sort of means by which vested interests are trying to uh, dampen our enthusiasm for action. Um, and doom and gloom is one way to do that. Um, you know, it's uh, the problem's just so big. Um, there's nothing that I can do personally. And so uh, as, as you allude to, a part of uh, the, the solution is individuals feeling engaged, feeling like they can do something about the problem. And that's why I always pair urgency with agency. Urgency, we need to act now. Agency, we have the means to act. We have the solutions at our disposal. Um, when it comes to making uh, decisions, you know, at the market, um, you know, uh, with our pocketbook, uh, the, the reason that it's so important to have incentives for renewable energy and uh, to have a price on carbon and other ways of, of pricing the externality, the damage that climate change is doing to the environment, is that people shouldn't have to think actively about climate change to make their purchasing decisions. It should be seamless. We should be guiding them towards making the right decisions. That's what market incentives do, because not everybody is going to actually care about climate change as much as we might try to convince them they should. But everybody can be part of the solution if we have larger incentives, systemic solutions that guide everybody in, in the right direction. And so, yes, let's engage people and let's make sure they understand that this is a crisis and it does require action now. And there are individual things that they can do um, to try to help out and make a good example for others. But let's also make sure that we push for the systemic solutions, for the policy solutions that we need to not just flatten the curve, but bring it down now on the other side. Okay, thank you. Right, our, our most pressing crisis at the moment is that we have one minute left. Um, so so I'm, I'm gonna challenge all three speakers to give me one word to sum up their thoughts. What's the, what's the word, single word you wanna give us? And I'm gonna start with, with Leo. Give me one word. Oh, thank you for that hospital class. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, so not one word, but at the top of my head, I would just say, I would just reinforce the, the point that Mike was making, uh, Mike made earlier around climate scientists or all scientists engaging on social media. It's going to be one of the most, the best things I've seen in the last five to 10 years of the number of climate scientists who've leapt onto social media, particularly Twitter. Mike is in a good example, Ed Hawkins, Catherine Hayhoe, et cetera, et cetera, have really, really helped myself as a journalist to rebut you know, incorrect information and media articles, etc. Um, but it's just so, a great. So the thing. correct he, answer there, Leo, was social media. <laughs> social media, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Because do we have a hard cut off, Chloe? You can nod, or you can. <laughs> no. So we, can we can we go for another five minutes if we want it? We we can maybe go for another two minutes. She says two minutes. Okay, so Yuta, that probably gives you the the luxury of two words if you want. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would like to have the words of Bruno Latour. We need to come back to a common reality and creating a common knowledge base between scientists, policymakers, and society through culture. So common reality are my two common words. Common reality. Cool. Michael? 
Um, I'm going to provide three words, uh, <laughs> urgency and agency, urgency and agency. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just going to toss into the mix care that we should all care and we need the knowledge to, to help us to care. And if any of my co-conveners want to chip in anything, you've been there, you've been patient, you've been wonderful in setting this thing up. Without you, we couldn't have done this. But if you want to throw any comments in, please do. Otherwise, Chloe will shut us up and we can go and do something else. But, but I'm enormously grateful to everyone who's joined this, enormously grateful to our speakers. Really, really hope that Simon, who, who wasn't able to join us today for, for, for health reasons, is, is on the road to recovery. Um, the reflection on social media and its importance, I think, resonates particularly for, for Simon's absence because he, he's, that's where he's doing his great stuff. Um, so I guess all that remains to say is thanks very much again. And hopefully we'll see you all in Vienna next year. Um, but certainly we'll see you one way or another through a screen, if not in Vienna. All right.